I've noticed there are a lot of people who seem confused about what market research is. Uh, the sense that I'm getting is that people think you just go to Chris Sikowski's blog at howtomarketagame.com and then you browse around until you find a graph that looks like this. And then you say, okay, there are not a lot of roguelikes and they're making the most revenue, so I should make one of those. And then you make the most bog-standard vanilla roguelike possible and strap a facile system like a talent tree on there just to justify its existence. This usually results in a kind of mediocre game. Consumers can easily identify it as a cash grab because, let's be honest, that's what you did. You simply looked at the genre that had the highest profit potential and then went from there. This kind of trend chasing can be a useful part of your market research, but there's still so much more to it. If we search for market research, we get this definition, the action or activity of gathering information about consumers' needs and preferences. Picking a genre isn't specific enough to meet the consumer's needs and preferences, since they're likely to have many, many games to choose from, so you'll need to dive a little bit deeper than that. To demonstrate, I'm going to explain how I did market research for my game. And full disclosure, my game is not overwhelmingly successful, but it does have an almost entirely positive review score. And more importantly, every review mentions something from my market research by name, which is what you want to see. When players can see a deliberate decision-making process, it makes them feel more confident about supporting you as a developer. My game is called The Last Craftsman. It's a farming simulator similar to Harvest Moon or Stardew Valley. So the very first thing I did when starting development was look for communities that are related to those types of games. We'll take the Cozy Gamers subreddit as a primary example. Subreddits are generally a pretty great place to start. You want to keep an eye on these communities and look for discussions about games that are similar to the one that you're creating. Naturally, Stardew Valley is the absolute biggest game in the genre, and no one is saying it doesn't deserve that title. But even so, there's no shortage of criticism about it. So it's easy to find threads like these. Stardew Valley is stressful, Stardew Valley is intimidating, not the definitive cozy game, and so on. The goal of your market research is to identify the trends within these discussions and keep track of things that people repeatedly mention that they like and dislike. The first big trend that I found is that Stardew Valley and even more recent games like Sunhaven or Fields of Mystria all have time management issues that can stress players out too much. In these games, there are items that are exclusive to different time periods. Certain crops, fish, and forageable items can only be obtained during certain windows. Many of these items are paramount to the player's progress. In Stardew Valley, for instance, an eel can only be caught in the ocean during spring and autumn, after 4pm, while it's raining. So forgetting to fish while it's raining during spring means you have to wait until autumn to try again which can leave players unable to complete the fishing bundle for five hours. Not through any fault of their own, but just because the game is arbitrarily forcing them to wait. Now, technically there's no time limit for completing these objectives. They can all be completed eventually, but players still feel like they're being punished for missing these seasonally exclusive items. Many of them state that they keep a wiki open for reference so they don't forget about an item and lose time. There's another angle to this problem, though. The passage of time is actually integral to the design of these games. There's a part that people actually like. They're often also called life simulators, because they simulate living in a small town with a simple job where you make friends and get married. In order to simulate life, we have to simulate the metric that we use to measure life, which is time. The availability of produce is based on the season in real life, and so it feels more immersive when it works the same way in the game. To break it down simply, players like the feeling of time passing. Seasonal items help promote that feeling, but players do not like that seasonal items impede their progress. In order to fix this, I created a tag system for items. Each item has a number of tags that are essentially the material components of that item. Items can be wood, copper, spooky, shiny, and these tags are what actually matter. 
The existence of these tags makes it so items are interchangeable and have differing levels of value for different tasks. So I can have the same seasonally exclusive items that the other games have, but I can make the tags universal. When you lose access to seasonal items, a different item will just fill that role instead, but maybe not as effectively. This allows me to keep the seasonal items, they will continue to affect your progress, but they will never prevent you from progressing. We can also look to the successes of other games to inform our research as well. Another common criticism of Stardew Valley is that the combat is not so great. There's a definite trend with this opinion since the same is said of My Time at Portia, Sunhaven, and Little Known Galaxy, which all have very similar features. The combat doesn't add a lot of depth, and the reaction time it requires feels incongruent with the other activities in the game. I don't think anyone would call Stardew's combat difficult, but it does demand a lot more attention than farming or picking flowers. I didn't know exactly how to approach this problem, so I looked to a different game called Littlewood. Littlewood seemed to acknowledge this problem as well and avoided doing any combat. Instead, they focused more on minigames with their own little progression paths. One of the minigames that stood out was a collectible card game that was really well received. So I started going down that route and looking at the potential positives of using a kind of battle card minigame instead of the more common action combat system that players don't seem to really enjoy. I realized that the card game doesn't require the same split-second decision-making, and it allows players to think and play at their own pace. The base game is also essentially about collecting items, so collecting cards feels like a natural extension of that behavior. I ended up designing the Ruins, which keeps the same sense of progression and adventure that Stardew's Mines do, but also leverages the advantages of a card-collecting minigame. The randomly generated dungeons get bigger and more difficult as you go down, but the difficulty doesn't rely on split-second decision-making. The Ruins also take the earlier lesson into account, the one about reducing stress caused by time limitations. The player doesn't enter these dungeons himself, and instead sends a robot character to do it in their place. The robot character lives in the ruins, so the player can pause a run whenever they'd like, go do other things, and then pick the run right back up from where they left it. It was a common complaint in the earlier research I did where players felt obligated to leave at checkpoints, and often ran out of time trying to reach them. You can also use your own intuition to inform your market research as well. This is really something you can only do if you are already a fan of the type of game you're making. I do play a lot of these farming simulators, and so I used my own opinion to come up with an idea that I think would be positive, even if I don't have any data to support it. A lot of these games are laid out in a very lateral fashion. You start the game with about 8 activities that you can engage with, then once you complete an activity, it's removed from relevance, and no longer needs to be interacted with. In Stardew, once you complete the mines, there's no reason to go back in. Once you've completed the community center, there's no reason to look at it. And once you've completed your house upgrades, Robin just becomes another MILF. This is not particularly bad design, since it leaves players with a constant sense of completion, like checking off a to-do list. However, it leaves the game feeling empty at the end, which is why anyone with more than 50 hours in a Stardew save is either building the world's largest industrial winery, decorating the town, or installing mods. Purely on instinct, I decided to build my game more vertically. Players start with a handful of things that they can do, and the game gets more complex the longer they play. The different parts of the game build on top of each other and create dependent relationships instead of having hard completion points. Like I said though, that part of my research is purely my own gut instinct. Part of designing a game is also figuring out what players are looking for before they even realize they're looking for it, and for that you can't really rely on data. These examples are just a small sample of the market research that informed my game design, but hopefully that points people in the right direction. Just to wrap things up, here are the three basic techniques to use while doing market research. 1. Look for common criticisms of existing games and find creative ways to solve them, like I did with the item tags. 
to look for existing solutions in similar games, like I found in Littlewood. And three, use your own intuition to make the game something that you would want to play, like I did with the vertical design. Thanks for watching, and best of luck!